I'm James Upton from Hill Dickinson's NHS employment team. I'm based in our Manchester office. I'm going to talk today about giving evidence at a virtual employment tribunal hearing because the tribunal are now hearing cases using their cloud video platform. Our 10 top tips for witnesses required to give evidence via CVP are as follows. Prepare. Ensure you're familiar with the video platform in advance of the hearing. Environment. Ensure there is a suitable environment in which to give evidence, quiet and free of disturbance. Equipment. Ensure appropriate computer hardware is available and you have a stable internet connection. Make an impression. Dress appropriately and select a suitable background effect. Influence. Ensure you do not have anyone guiding you or influencing your evidence. Documents. Ensure you have access to all relevant documents but have not marked them in any way. Print documents if required. Be early. Log into the hearing earlier than required and observe so you're not giving evidence cold. Contact. Ensure there is a means of immediate contact with your representative. Radio silence. However, do not try to discuss the case with them while you're giving evidence. And finally, no recordings. Do not record or broadcast the hearing. It is a criminal offence. Hi everyone, my name's Eleanor. I'm a legal director. I'm normally based in the Leeds office, but today working from home, like most of you are. I specialise in information law, and there's a development that I thought you might be interested in about Brexit and data protection. So in the summer, the European courts ruled that it would be very difficult for organisations based in the EU to export their data out to the US. The reason for this was the wide ranging powers that are available to the authorities in the US to access that personal information. So in practice, the data would not be very well protected because the CIA could access pretty much all of it. So that ruling itself was caused problems because there are obviously a lot of transfers of data that happen between the US and the UK. But there's a bigger question for the UK about what it means for data transfers following Brexit. So to state the obvious, after Brexit, we'll no longer be a member of the EU and the courts will look at our data protection laws in the same way they've looked at the laws of the US. Like the US, our um, intelligence agencies have quite wide ranging powers to access personal information. Do those powers mean that it will become very difficult for organisations in the EU to share their data with organisations based in the UK. We don't know at the moment, but we really hope that we'll get an answer over the next couple of months because this is quite a significant issue for a lot of our clients. Hello, I'm Rachel Kelly Brandreth, Associate in the Liverpool Healthcare Advisory Team. This month has seen an update to the Who Pays guidance, which came into effect on the 1st of September. This guidance sets out the framework for establishing which NH body, NHS body is responsible for paying a provider of healthcare services for an individual's NHS care and treatment. An update is welcome, as the previous 2013 guidance had become significantly outdated in some areas. Further, a renewed focus on the duty of candour, with an NHS trust being issued with a fine for failing to comply with its obligations under the duty of candour regulations. From a healthcare advisory perspective, this reinforces the need to be open and honest with families about the treatment of their loved ones. As not only does it lead to potential issues with complaints, RCAs and inquests, but equally now a financial penalty can be given. If you have any further questions on these points, then please do not hesitate to contact a member of the healthcare advisory team. <laughs>